Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on breeding and genetics considerations for organic dairy farms. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is an online community of more than 700 ag service providers and farmers who are providing science, experience, and regulation-based certified organic information on the web. Together we publish articles, videos, and other content at eExtension.org. This webinar is part of an ongoing series focused on certified organic dairy production systems. You can see more information about these webinars, find the recording of today's session, and view our other content on our website at www.eextension.org slash organic underscore production. Okay, now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Brad Hines is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Minnesota with a focus on organic dairy production. He also serves on the Minnesota Organic Advisory Task Force. Brad received his PhD at the University of Minnesota where his research focused on the profitability of crossbreeding dairy cattle. Currently, Brad conducts research at the University of Minnesota's West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, uh, Minnesota, which has a certified organic herd and a conventional herd. At the center, Brad has been looking at crosses with Holsteins, Jerseys, Montbillards, Normandy, New Zealand Frisians, and Scandinavian and Swedish Reds. Brad, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Deb. Uh, like to thank everybody for coming today and uh, kind of a nice topic to talk about, uh, one that I get excited about, breeding and genetics. Um, I have a real fondness for a lot of the breeds and uh, we're going to talk about some of the crossbreeding work that we've done here at the University of Minnesota and then at the end talk about different breeds and characteristics of those breeds that you might use in a grazing or organic uh, dairy farm. Uh, just a little background, as Deb said, I'm at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota, which is in the western part of the state, where we are milking about 225 cows. Um, we've got an organic herd here, been certified for two years, and then a conventional grazing herd alongside of that, where we're using all of these different breeds that we're going to talk about. Uh, just a schematic of our whole research station, uh, we've got almost 400, uh, over 400 acres of pasture that we can use for uh, grazing all of these cattle um, and there's animals everywhere so it's a, a nice uh, research station to be at. However today we're going to talk about breeding and genetics. Um, a picture here of our uh, herd out on grass. Um, you can see the many different colors that we have and those are characteristics of the many different breeds that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Jersey, Normandy, Holstein, uh, you name it, uh, we've got it here. So one thing um, is that dairy producers want is a cow that um, has longevity. And how do we get longevity? Really, we want something that's easily maturing. Uh, they don't have a lot of problems calving. Uh, we want high milk production, obviously. Um, superior fertility. We want cows that breed back and if you're a seasonal calver you want them to breed back in a short window of time. Well, you also want a, a functional udder, um, one that's easy to milk, and you want a cow that has sound feet and legs, able to rock, walk around pastures without any lame problems, and you want something that's disease resistant, one that's able to fight off all those diseases, uh, especially mastitis. And then if we get all these things, obviously we get uh, longevity and potentially profitability, extended profitability. So first I want to talk a little bit about crossbreeding and why a lot of producers are using crossbreeding. Really crossbreeding in the U.S. started with uh, grazing dairy producers uh, long before even conventional producers started crossbreeding. I know some producers that have been crossbreeding their herd for 20 to 25 years. And really the big interest uh, first started because of calving difficulty. We know that even in especially pure Holsteins, uh, calving difficulty hinders those first calf heifers. And then you get 
the big fertility problems that we've seen in, in most environments for Holsteins. We see it even in our uh, grazing herd out here that the fertility of the Holsteins has declined. Health problems are increasing and we're also seeing more cows dying on farms. Um, some farms are quite low but there are others that are up in the 12 to 15 percent. And certainly cows are calving less times during their lives. So when we talk about crossbreeding, really from a, uh, we talk about two different things. Inbreeding depression, which is from mating cows and bulls that are related, and that's with inbreed. So like the Holstein breed uh, today, uh, there can be some inbreeding depression when there's a lot of uh, highly related sires being used on, on cows, and uh, we get those problems of, of decreased fertility, decreased health, and lower survival. However, the opposite of inbreeding depression is heterosis, or what uh, we call hybrid vigor. And it's from mating bulls and cows that are unrelated, um, and usually is expressed for those lowly heritable traits, mortality, fertility, uh, health, and survival. Uh, this is a diagram about what heterosis really is. Uh, heterosis for milk production, you've got two breeds um, and their respective production averages. And if you cross that breed uh, here, you can see uh, 20,000 pounds of milk for a crossbred. And um, heterosis is that added bonus above the average of the parents. So we're getting about a 1,500 pound bonus above the average of breed A and breed B, which equates to about 8% heterosis in this example. So a little bit about um, some crossbreeding studies that we've had. Uh, this was um, my PhD work. I worked with some herds in California. Um, some were confinement herds. Uh, others were grazing herds. And one of the herds um, had converted to organic dairy production while we were on the study. So it's kind of a wide range of uh, environments that we've had uh, for this study. Uh, these herds used um, many different breeds. They first started with Jersey uh, and used Milking Shorthorn and Ayrshire, but they did settle on the four breeds that are listed there. And uh, Scandinavian Red, I'll refer to that as, that's a combination of Swedish Red and Norwegian Red. We had quite a few cows um, in this study, almost 1,500 cows. Um, all cows were AI sired um, sires and AI maternal grandsires. You can see the number of sires that were used in the study. Um, some maybe um, not as many sires as, as what we'd like, but uh, a fair representation of each breed. An idea of what uh, a Normandy Holstein might look at. Uh, this picture is of a Normandy Holstein crossbred cow actually taken at our Minnesota State Fair. Uh, we had a Normandy show here at the State Fair for a number of years and uh, one that was shown there. Here's a Montbilliard Holstein at one of the dairies in California out eating the nice plush rye grass. And you'll see the typical white head, um, kind of like a semental uh, on the, those Montbilliard crosses, and Swedish red cross on uh, one of the dairies as well. Um, kind of a nice red colored cow, looks like a Holstein, but is predominantly red. In the beginning, we looked at calving difficulty and stillbirth of uh, these cows. So these were actually Holstein cows bred to either Holstein Montbilliard or Scandinavian Red in first lactation. And um, the Scandinavian Red had the lowest calving difficulty as well as the uh, lowest stillbirth rate when bred to Holstein cows. So using those uh, Swedish and Norwegian Red breeds really reduced calving difficulty in stillbirth. Uh, Holsteins were quite high, um, maybe a little bit above national average, but uh, I've seen a lot of farms around this uh, percentages. When you use those breeds on um, older Holstein cows, here we added the Normandy breed in with significant numbers. These herds tended not to use Normandy in first lactation 
Holstein heifers, they were a little worried about calving difficulty, so they didn't use it too often in those. But they did use it on the older cows. Um, but then again, we look at the older cows, the Scandinavian red uh, crossbred calves had the lowest uh, calving difficulty, and there was uh, a significant reduction in stillbirth when using either Normandy, Montpelier, or Scandinavian red compared to using a Holstein on a Holstein cow. So the next question uh, that we asked, well, sure we get these crossbred calves, well, how do they, what is their calving difficulty? So when they calve for a first time and first lactation, uh, what do they do? So we looked at uh, Holstein cows compared to those crossbred um, cows, and here all of the calves were actually crossbred, so they were either bred to brown Swiss, Montvilliard, or Scandinavian red, so these are all crossbred calves. And still, the Holstein cow had problems giving birth to a crossbred calf. And Scandinavian red was the lowest, uh, even though all the breeds were significantly lower uh, for calving difficulty. And again, the, the Montbilliard and Scandinavian red were, were a lot lower um, for stillbirth than a Holstein cow having a crossbred calf. A big thing uh, that um, a lot of producers look at is death rate. Uh, it can be pretty disappointing when you go out to your pen or pasture and see a dead cow or calf. So we looked at the deaths during just first lactation um, of these cows in the herds, and the crossbred cows had fewer deaths prior to first uh, test day. We have a lot of cows that maybe don't make it to first milk recording. There was almost 4% of the Holsteins didn't make it to a first DHI test. However, when we looked out over across the first 305 days, again, fewer crossbreds died uh, to 305 days than Holsteins. Almost 5 over 5% 5 of the Holsteins died in the first 305 days. We also looked at the total removals, so we added cows that were called for either repro, mastitis, uh, lameness, other issues. And we, about 9% of the Holstein cows did not make it to a first milk recording, uh, which is quite high. And only uh, less than 3% of the crossbreds uh, were removed prior to that first DHI test. However, the big advantage for the crossbreds is out carrying out to 305 days, 16% of the Holsteins uh, didn't make it to a second lactation, didn't even make it to uh, 305 days in milk whereas uh, only lost 7.5% uh, of the crossbreds during that first 305 days. So then we looked at uh, many different traits for these cows uh, in these herds, um, fertility, um, production. Here I'll present just the fertility results. We looked at uh, days open um, for these cows. The average um, for the Holstein cows, about 148 days across all lactations. That's um, what you would normally see for an average for Holstein cows in the U.S. And all three of the crossbred groups had significantly fewer days open than a pure Holstein. About three weeks less for the Normandy and Montbilliard uh, crossbreds, and about two weeks fewer days open um, than the Scandinavian reds. So that can equate to uh, one less heat period. They're, they're getting bred uh, sooner. So we know that these cows can get pregnant. The other people ask, well, what about production? Do these cows produce? And uh, so here are the averages. This is across um, all lactations for 305 days. We looked at uh, the first five lactations of these cows, and the Holsteins are at fairly high production, 25,000 pounds of milk. Um, however, the, the Normandy Holsteins are about 10% less uh, on a fat plus protein basis. Usually we like to gauge these breeds on a fat and protein basis. The Montbilliard Holsteins are about 3% less in production and about 4% less than um, 
uh, Holstein with the Scandinavian rats. Now these are 305 day lactations. It's not uh, completed lactations or long lactations. And then some cows um, are projected to 305 days. Those cows that maybe leave at 150 days or die early are given credit for more milk than uh, they actually have produced. And we'll talk about lifetime production in a couple slides. But we wanted to look at somatic cell count as well. Now these averages are quite low, but you have to remember these dairies are from California, so they typically have a lot lower somatic cell count than herds might in either the Midwest uh, or the Northeast. But really no difference in somatic cell count between Holsteins and Normandy Holsteins. Uh, however, there was a significant reduction in somatic cell count when either using Montbilliard or Scandinavian red uh, crossbreds in these herds. So we wanted to look at, um, we've looked at the 305 production, so what about lifetime and profitability? So we looked at some herds uh, um, to get a balanced representation for profitability. Um, survival, uh, this is survival to fourth calving. Only 30% of the Holstein cows made it to fourth calving, whereas over 50% uh, of the crossbreds made it to a fourth calving. So uh, this will uh, equate to uh, big economics in, in our calculations that those cows can survive a lot longer than, than a pure Holstein cow. Here's those lifetime production averages. Um, you can see we looked at fat and protein, and um, those crossbred cows had 11 to 21 percent greater lifetime production than than a pure Holstein cow. And this is just a reflection of their longevity. Those cows stayed around a lot longer, so of course they're going to have more lifetime production. Uh, so we looked at uh, lifetime profit. Um, here are the values that we used for profitability. Um, we tried to account for replacement costs for raising those heifers, uh, a feed cost of $5.33 a day, corrected for body weight, and we used the average milk price of $15.61 uh, in the U.S. from 2007 to 2009. And here are the results for lifetime profit. Um, you can see the crossbreds uh, all had 26% uh, to 50% greater lifetime profit uh, than a pure Holstein, and which is a reflection of their days in the herd. You can see they averaged three to 400 days longer in the herd than a pure Holstein cow. So we also broke those profitability down by profit per day. A lot of producers think in uh, profitability, what, what is she profiting for me today? Um, unfortunately, the Normandies uh, were about 7% less on a profit per day uh, standpoint, uh, which is probably a reflection of they just didn't have enough milk production to, um, on a daily basis to uh, be more profitable than a Holstein, at least in these herds. And the uh, Montbilliard and Scandinavian Red had 4% uh, to 5% higher daily profit than a pure Holstein. So that can add up uh, quite a bit if you've got a herd of 100 or 200 cows. Uh, the profit starts to add up quite quickly uh, the more numbers in your herd. So that's California. Um, now we want to give you some results from some of the work that we've done here at the University of Minnesota on our uh, crossbreeding research. Uh, we have two camp campus herds. Uh, well, we've got a campus herd in St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis, where the, the main campus is. And then we've got the research herd uh, here at Morris. And we first started out breeding to Jersey AI sires. We've used Montbilliard in the past. And then into the future, we've, um, for some of the rotations, we've replaced the Swedish red. Uh, we've replaced the Jersey with the Swedish red, and we'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, typical Jersey Holstein uh, crossbred cow, black and white, uh, out on pasture here. That's uh, what they typically work, would look like. So we've bred those Jersey Holsteins to Montbilliard. And this is uh, one of the, the Montbilliard um, Jersey Holstein crossbred cows that uh, we've had uh, born at Morris. Uh, this is actually her daughter. We've 
spread those back to Holstein. We were following a rotation. So this is a 5 8 Holstein cow. Uh, looks pretty much like a Holstein, maybe just a little bit smaller in body size. And then we bred that to, uh, this is actually her daughter, uh, out of a Swedish Red Bull. Uh, so a really nice looking uh, uh, crossbred cow. Uh, we see the same results for the Jersey Holstein crosses that we saw in California. Uh, those cows tend to stay and calve more times than pure Holstein cows. Uh, there's a tendency uh, for more of the Jersey Holsteins to calve here at, uh, in these university herds than a pure Holstein cow. Uh, so these are um, maybe the good things about the Jersey Holstein uh, crosses that we've seen and observed at our uh, research herds. They have lower body weight through all three lactations. Um, um, they have higher body condition scores, which probably equates to better fertility. You can see um, the three-week difference in days open in first lactation, and that uh, grows significantly uh, into second and third lactation, where there's uh, 42 days fewer days open for the crossbreds than a pure Holstein cow. Um, and then we've looked at production, somatic cell count, and uh, udder clearance for these cows. Um, production, maybe they do have, uh, they do have significantly lower production uh, in second and third lactation on a fat and protein basis, uh, so maybe not so good there. Uh, there is a tendency for those Jersey Holstein crosses to have higher somatic cell counts uh, the older they get, so in third lactation that number um, is higher. And udder clearance was measured from the ground to the bottom of the udder. So uh, there is less clearance. So those udders are um, closer to the ground. Um, however, those Jersey Holstein crossbred cows are shorter in stature, but they do have deeper udders um, uh, when we've measured those out. And that is the problem with some of the Jersey Holstein crosses. Their, their udder tends to get a lot deeper as they get older. Uh, just some of our uh, cows, you can see the wide variety on pasture that we have. Um, we've also looked at the Montbilliard Holstein and the three uh, breed crosses here at Morris in our grazing dairy. And this is the first lactation results, really no difference in production for fat and protein and no difference for somatic cell count in first lactation for those cows. And second lactation, we see the, the same results really no difference in production. We're not losing any production by uh, crossing uh, Holstein cows with uh, other breeds. However, in third lactation, you see a difference in production. Those um, Montbilliard Holstein crossbred cows um, do have significantly higher production um, in milk and fat and protein than a pure Holstein cow, about 12% more. And they do have lower somatic cell count than um, a Holstein cow here in, in our grazing dairy. I've also looked at some of the other uh, crossbreeding rotations that we've used here at, at Morris and uh, you can see the number of cows. I just put up the milk, fat, and protein. And I also looked at uh, mastitis percentage. I wanted to see what sort of clinical mastitis cases these cows have had. Um, the Holsteins, uh, about 18,000 pounds of milk. Really no difference. Uh, the fourth breed down is a Holstein, uh, Montbilliard Jersey Holstein, so a 5 8 Holstein. Um, no difference in production there. Um, the bottom one, the NZ uh, SGH is a New Zealand Frisian out of a Swedish Red Jersey Holstein. And you can see the production figures there, maybe a little bit less um, fat and protein than a Holstein, but um, more than the, the 5 8 Holstein above it. For mastitis, um, we do have uh, quite a bit of mastitis in our grazing herd. Uh, you can see the percentages. The New Zealand uh, Frisian crossbred does have significantly lower mastitis cases than a purebred Holstein cow, as well as some of the other breed groups uh, that we have. Days open in these cows, uh, really the same thing that we've seen uh, in the, the Jersey crossbreds. Um, around three to four week difference um, um, 
for fewer days open. We also looked at survival and how these cows survived to fifth calving. Uh, we do have smaller numbers out at fifth calving. Not um, um, have all of them have made it to fifth calving yet, but you can see the trend uh, is showing that, uh, especially survived to fourth calving. 44% of the Montbilliard Holsteins calved a fourth time, whereas only 16% of our Holsteins did. So really, the Holsteins are not staying around in in um, our university research herds as well, even though we uh, maybe try and keep them around for some studies. Uh, we looked at survival of those cows uh, within three years of, of calving, and it looks like the, the crossbred stay three to four, uh, three to five months longer in the herd um, than a pure Holstein. And then we looked at mortality rate as well. Yes, these crossbred cows, sometimes they do die, uh, but we're uh, losing a lot less to death. Only 4% of those cows versus 17% of the Holsteins have died. I also acquired some data from uh, a herd that was looking at uh, Normandy times Jersey crossbreeding. Um, they had purebred Jersey herds and they wanted to, to crossbreed those as well. Uh, so they used Normandy on those breeds. And here are the results. I'll Although they're small numbers, uh, you can see that the Normandy Jersey um, crossbred cows had higher milk production than a pure Jersey cow. There was no difference in, in really fat or protein uh, for those cows, but kind of a tendency for them to have a, a higher milk production uh, than a purebred Jersey cow when you're breeding those to Normandy. So there may be some benefits to using Normandy in uh, Jersey within a rotation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future about what we're doing here um, at in our organic dairy. I've had uh, uh, people interested in, I've talked to some producers that are really interested in using FLECV um, uh, from Austria uh, and the Alps uh, region. Um, I've been to some farms. I was actually in a farm in Germany last year that uh, um, a biodynamic farm that was actually using FLECV. Uh, the cow in the upper left-hand corner is 18 years old, according to the producer, um, and um, these are nice, big, beautiful cows. There's been some um, showing of these cows at World Dairy Expo in Madison, Wisconsin, where they've had a display of different uh, crossbred cows out of FLECV. Uh, this is one of the cows that was shown uh, at World Dairy Expo uh, in, in the trade booth, uh, in the grazing pavilion that we've had there, um, showing off that breed as well. There hasn't been a lot of research done with the FLECV, at least in the U.S., um, as far as scientific results uh, showing the advantages of FLECV, if there are any. Um, we've there are some results here um, that I presented that was research done in Holland, and these are first lactation results from uh, pure Holsteins compared to the Fleck v. Holstein. It looks like the, the Fleck v. do have a little bit uh, less production on a fat and protein basis than a purebred Holstein, um, lower somatic cell count, uh, but they do have better fertility. Uh, uh, less calving difficulty and less stillbirth issues in, in the study in Holland. So some of the things we're, we like to tell producers uh, that are interested in crossbreeding and using these breeds, obviously it, it's a system that complements genetic improvement of the breeds. Uh, we want you to use the best AI bull uh, within a breed to get that genetic improvement, um, to be able to have a, a, a top producing herd. and that heterosis is certainly a bonus on top of genetic improvement, and we figure we're getting around 3 to 10 percent uh, uh, for production and greater than 10 percent uh, for fertility, health, and survival in the research studies that we've done. Now, one thing we, we certainly recommend is using three breeds uh, if you're going to crossbreed. Uh, two breeds certainly limits the amount of heterosis, um, and four breeds kind of limits the influence of, of specific breeds in your crossbreeding rotation. Therefore, we kind of, uh, we, we like to use three breeds in, in our herds as well. 
Uh, this is the U.S. cow population uh, for cows and DHI herds. Uh, you can see the number of mixed breed herds is on the increase. Uh, in 2009, almost 7% of the cows in the U.S. on DHI were, were mixed breeds and crossbreds, about 5% Jerseys and 87% Holstein. So let's talk a little bit about um, some breed characteristics uh, that you might use uh, for herds in your organic dairy and, and what some of the advantages and, and disadvantages of are using those breeds. Uh, the brown breeds, certainly Jersey uh, brown Swiss uh, that a lot of producers use for Jersey. There's many good things, uh, outstanding calving ease. The calves almost fall out. Uh, they have increased solids content of milk, high fat and protein. Uh, they probably have lower maintenance costs. They're maybe more efficient on grass. And there's an increased frequency of the black hooves, which certainly can help in reducing lameness uh, when those cows are on pasture. However, they do have some negatives. Um, the udders may become too mature, um, too deep as those cows get older. Um, the bull calves are almost um, worth nothing. Uh, that can be a problem as well. And you can see an increased somatic cell count uh, in the milk, and that's what we've seen by using those the breed in, in our herd. Brown Swiss. Uh, a lot of people uh, talk about brown Swiss. They're very high production. They have uh, high fat and protein. If you look at the, the averages um, for U.S. cows, the brown Swiss is probably the highest crossbred for production on a fat and protein basis. They have really good feet and legs uh, low, and low somatic cell count in milk. However, you see an increase in body size. Maybe for some producers, a brown Swiss might be too big. Uh, you've got uh, maybe uh, a brown Swiss calf problem, increased calf mortality, and, and some cows uh, demand nipple feeding, maybe not like drinking from a bucket or, or anything like that, so the calves can be maybe a little more challenging to raise than what you like. We talk about uh, the red breeds, um, Norwegian red, Swedish red, and Finnish Ayrshire, kind of that uh, Scandinavian cluster of breeds. Um, Swedish red and Finnish Ayrshire now are uh, what uh, people would call a Viking red. And you can see the number of cows um, in those countries. So really not um, small breeds by any uh, standpoint. They're really a good number of cows of all these breeds. So what are some of the characteristics that we like to see for the, the Viking red, what you, you might expect? They're about medium-sized cows, around 1,250 pounds at maturity. Uh, they do have high levels of milk and protein. Uh, from our research studies, we showed that they do have similar milk production to a Holstein cow. They have excellent fertility. Uh, they can produce a calf. They get bred right away. Uh, calving ease, we've shown that uh, those calves have uh, a lot less calving ease, as well as when um, a Viking red crossbred cow calves, she has less calving difficulty and stillbirth problems. They do have a lower somatic cell count. They've tended to select for mastitis resistance and lower somatic cell count for those cows in Sweden and, and uh, uh, Scandinavia. They have long productive life. Or if you, you use a Norwegian red, they do have some uh, Swedish Frisian blood in there, which might uh, get some black animals. If people get some black animals, uh, they're expecting red. Uh, it might be because of some of the free Swedish Friesen in that breed, um, which may reduce heterosis, but that uh, those genetics are um, many generations back in the pedigree. And we also talk about the, the Alps breeds um, in the, the Swiss Alps, the French Alps, uh, Montpellier, uh, about 400,000 cows on France. Uh, this is really a dairy breed. It's selected for milk production and cheese production on grass. Uh, so it's typically not, not a dual purpose breed at all. The Normandy, about 280,000 cows, the third largest breed in France uh, up on the northern coast. Obviously the, the beaches of Normandy, there's many uh, Normandy cows up in that area. And again, not a dual purpose breed. Uh, there is some value added production that you get out of these cows once you cull them. 
you retain probably higher value, but they are selected for milk production uh, and uh, cheese production, and they're probably well suited for low input systems and, and grazing systems. And then you have the Fleckvie or Semmental breeds. Uh, there's large numbers of these cows in Austria, Germany, uh, Switzerland, uh, Italy. And they are more of a dual purpose breed. There is more of an emphasis placed on beef characteristics in a Fleck V type breed uh, than, than the Montbiard or, or Normandy breeds. Again, this is uh, what typical cows would look like, purebred cows, uh, Montbilliard, about 400,000 cows in France, 265,000 Normandy cows, so uh, they are typically a brindled colored type cow, a brown cow, and the Fleck V is very similar looking to uh, Montbilliard and quite a few numbers of cows there. So the Montbilliard characteristics, uh, similar characteristics to the Fleck V, they have high levels of milk and protein production. Uh, I showed results earlier that uh, they do have higher levels than a pure Holstein when they're out on grass, right from our, uh, our Morris dairy here. They have excellent fertility. Uh, they get bred back uh, a lot quicker uh, than, than a Holstein. Calving yeast, really not a, not a big problem of those cows. You maybe have some um, bigger calves out of Holstein cows, older ones, but really there shouldn't be too many issues with calving difficulty by using a, a Montbilliard uh, uh, for crossbreeding. Really, they have high health, a uh, few transition problems, uh, low somatic cell count, resistance to mastitis. They have long productive life, and there's some excellent beef characteristics. Once uh, they get to the end of their productive life and they need to go to market, uh, you can get high beef prices uh, for these um, for these crossbreds uh, uh, animals with Montbilliard or Fleck feed them. I've had some producers talk to me and, and they're using Montbilliard because they can get uh, good beef characteristics and some are raising uh, grass beef uh, dairy steers with Montbilliard and they think they can get a higher price with those. So here's a typical Montbilliard uh, purebred cow. Uh, I was in France, so I took this picture. You can see they do carry more condition on them, uh, but again, really good udder, uh, good feet and legs uh, on those cows, and, and some of them still do use bells um, in, in those herds. So what about the Normandy? Uh, Normandy has high protein content uh, in the milk. Uh, they do have a higher proportion of uh, BB kappa casein. Um, a lot of um, we're selecting bulls here. Uh, we're using Normandy in our crossbreeding rotation in our uh, organic dairy here. And I am uh, putting some consideration on uh, BB kappa casein uh, in the milk. They have exceptional fertility, uh, really high fertile cows. Uh, they don't have many calving problems. They're very docile. Uh, uh, they're outstanding grazers. Um, they can almost graze uh, year-round in the Normandy region of France, so they are uh, bred for uh, grazing ability, and uh, they can certainly adapt to many different kinds of environments. There's a, a more, almost more Normandy cows in Colombia than there are actually in France, so they're uh, grazing cattle and dairy production in Colombia as well. And just like the Montbilliard, there's enhanced value of cull cows, bulls, and calves uh, when they're end of their productive life. Uh, here's what a typical um, purebred Normandy might look like from a, a dairy in, in France. Um, we've uh, got good feet and legs, a uh, good uttered cow, um, and you've got that brindled color as well that uh, signifies uh, the Normandy breed. I do get uh, a lot of questions about, uh, producers call me, about uh, using New Zealand Frisian genetics. Um, and we've used New Zealand Frisian in our, our organic dairy here as well. Uh, however, there are some characteristics. There are certainly medium-sized cows, which is a, a, a very good positive about the New Zealand Frisian. Uh, there are smaller cows. They're more fertile than, than U.S. Holsteins. Um, However, they do maybe have less milk volume um, than, than some of the other breed combinations that, that you might use. Um, they are 
maybe used on a different environment in New Zealand. Uh, there's not much concentrate is rarely fed in New Zealand, and uh, they do feed a low amount of hay and silage compared to the U.S., uh, so they don't supplement their cows like many grazing producers do here in the U.S. So maybe it's um, maybe they don't respond well with uh, supplementation strategies. Um, and the graph shows there is a fairly high percentage of North American Holstein present in the New Zealand Frisian. Um, about 40% of the genes in a New Zealand Frisian are U.S. Holsteins as well. And one thing, I guess, we just need more research on uh, using New Zealand Frisian genetics under U.S. management situations. I know there's uh, producers in, in Missouri, grazing producers, that uh, um, use a lot of New Zealand Frisian as well. Uh, so there are uh, places that are using it. We just need more research uh, that shows uh, whether these cows are, are able to adapt to grazing situations uh, here in the U.S. Uh, went out and snapped this picture. is basically what a typical maybe New Zealand Frisian crossbred would look like. This one's out of a Norwegian red Jersey Holstein uh, in our herd. And you can see a nice medium-sized cow, uh, pretty much black and white cow, uh, will look like a Holstein. and and does uh, um, and and you can see some of the advantages that I showed uh, before in, in mastitis resistance at our dairy. I get some questions about uh, using pulled genetics. Uh, there's obviously a growing interest in using pulled genetics uh, with from an animal welfare standpoint and and dehorning calves uh, when they're quite young. Uh, so a lot of people are are asking about pole genetics and where they can find pole genetics. Obviously, all breeds have some pole genetics, uh, which are, are naturally hornless. Um, the gene for um, pole is a single dominant gene, and uh, horn is recessive. Um, so really, horn cattle, it's a, it's a recessive gene, even though uh, some people, a lot of people might not think that horns are recessive. Uh, the Norwegian red breed does have a very high percentage of pole genes. Uh, uh, the Jersey breed in the U.S. Uh, is also uh, got some uh, high percentage of uh, pole genes. And about 60% of the calves in Norway are actually polled uh, when they're born. So really, uh, they've put some emphasis on uh, pole genetics more so in Norway than they have in a lot other parts of the world um, in trying to reduce their uh, their horn genes. So this is just a diagram on, on how you can get um, pulled genetics if you're looking to use uh, pulled genetics in your herd and, and how you might get pulled genetics. That's really quite easy. It, uh, um, it doesn't take very long to start getting pulled genetics in your herds once you're using bulls that are actually pulled. Uh, um, so you you know, kind of follow this diagram if you are selecting bulls and want to place a little more emphasis on on the pole. You certainly can can do that and change your herd um, um, to to pull. So these uh, last few slides that I have uh, here are just a little like uh, uh, diagrams about what we're using at uh, the University of Minnesota in terms of breeds and and what we're trying to achieve and. Uh, this is a kind of a new three-breed crossbred rotation that we're using here in our dairy. Um, we're, we've got Jersey, the Scandinavian Red, uh, either Swedish, Finnish, or Norwegian, whatever bulls rank high. Uh, we do select the, the top bulls, the top AI bulls of the breed, uh, um, and Normandy as well. And you can, so, really, a, a Normandy crossbred would be bred to Jersey, a Jersey crossbred would be bred to Scandinavian Red, and those Scandinavian Red uh, animals would be bred to Normandy. And really we're trying to develop a, a cow uh, without Holstein in it that is efficient on grass and maybe doesn't need as much uh, supplementation. We all know that uh, organic grain prices are quite high, uh, 14 to I've heard $16 here in the Midwest for corn, uh, which is, is quite high. So can we develop a, a cow that 
doesn't need as much grain or need any grain um, um, and can be fairly efficient and have high production and good fertility. And then we also are, are using this, uh, I guess, what they tend to call it Procross in the U.S. Uh, uh, in our organic dairy as well, uh, where we're using U.S. Holsteins. Uh, those crossbreds are bred to a Swedish red sire, um, and then the Swedish red are bred to Montbilliard. So we're uh, trying to look at some of the, uh, in the future, we'll look at genotype by environment interaction. Does one crossbred uh, group do better um, in, in a grazing and organic situation as well? Also, I don't forget, uh, we do have Holsteins. We have pure Holsteins in, in our organic herd, so we're, we're comparing those. Uh, we, we haven't given up on those yet. They're a good cow. They're a high-producing cow. Uh, they just maybe have some, some issues that uh, they need to work out. But we're, we're um, comparing all of our crossbred cows to, to Holstein in a grazing and organic situation as well. So really, an uh, ideal grazing cow, what, what would you expect to look for in an ideal grazing cow on an organic farm? What you should look for, you want one that's high fat and protein, uh, excellent fertility, uh, high longevity, maybe five to seven years, which is a lot longer than you would see in, in typical confinement situations. You want lower somatic cell count, a smaller functional type cow, uh, one that efficiently converts grass to milk. Uh, you want, um, and then, you know, when when you're selecting breeds, um, I talk to producers, and it certainly depends on each producer's management situation, what their style is, and what they can use. So I've uh, uh, presented many of the different breeds and, and some of the results that we've had, but I think the, the key is maybe AI is, is a must when using uh, these breeds uh, for an ideal grazing cow. Uh, here are some of the, the further resources that you can uh, look at um, for some of the crossbreeding research. There's been um, a lot of grass-based research done in Ireland. Um, in the U.S. and then uh, if you want more information on some of these breeds, uh, some of the websites are listed below that talk about uh, Normandy and Montbilliard, Norwegian Red, Flexi, things like that. And you're, if you're interested in more scientific results, uh, you can look in the Journal of Dairy Science. I've li listed some of the authors that have done research myself. Uh, Chad Deckow's done some brown Swiss crossbreeding. Uh, Katie Olson uh, done some more Jersey crossbreeding work. Uh, Stefan Blotner from Germany has done some crossbreeding work on brown Swiss in Germany, and Frank Buckley out of um, Ireland has done some Norwegian red and some Jersey work there as well. So with that, I uh, hope hopefully you've uh, um, learned a little bit about some of the breeds, some of the work that we've done here at the University of Minnesota uh, for breeding and genetics, and, and hopefully if you can take some of these results, and uh, um, if you're ever interested in talking more about some of these breeds or, or have some questions, uh, I have my contact information there, and feel free to contact me anytime. I thank you all for attending, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to our question and answer period. And there was a question about uh, kappa casein. Um, you had mentioned when you were describing the Normandy breed, um, that they have a high percentage of kappa casein. And um, she, uh, this person was curious about uh, what is kappa casein and why is it important? Well, the, the, the kappa casein gene um, is, you can either have an A locus or, or a B locus. And really, we're trying to select for those cows that have a BB. So they have the double uh, B kappa casein. And really, that's more from a cheese-making standpoint. So you can get more cheese uh, from more cheese output from those uh, cows that that have a higher percentage of BB kappa casein uh, in the milk. I have a a goal to uh, develop a small artisan cheese processing plant here at uh, our research farm. So can we develop a breed with a higher percentage of kappa casein to develop? Um, 
artisan cheeses, and that's really what those are for. The Normandy has a high percentage. Uh, some of the other breeds, Jersey has a higher percentage of uh, BB Kappa casein as well. Great, thank you. Um, and this person asks, how can you tell whether a polled sire is true, uh, PP versus PH, from the typical sire proof in a sire, mag a sire catalog? Uh, usually in in the um, in a sire catalog, they're going to list whether that um, uh, bull is sired. Usually they put a, a, behind the name of the sire, they'll put a large P, a capital P behind it, and there you can distinguish whether um, that sire is polled or not. That will, will sire polled calves. Uh, there, are, there are some in all breeds, uh, some are, are less. Maybe Holstein doesn't quite have as many high percentage of polled uh, bulls, but uh, they're growing. The red and white Holstein has a, a, a number of bulls that are polled as well, but the capital P is, is how they're distinguishing polled genetics. Okay, great. Um, this person asks, what is the best breed for little or na no grain supplementation, and what level of milk production would you expect? Uh, well, the <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, there's um, many, I think you can use many different breeds uh, for uh, no grain supplementation. Like I've shown before, um, we're trying to develop a breed maybe here uh, with Normandy, Jersey, and Swedish Red that you can use uh, for no grain supplementations. We think they will do very well at converting grass to milk. Um, again, the New Zealand Frisian has um, doesn't use as much supplementation in New Zealand, so that might be a good option for using um, if you're not supplementing uh, any grain in your herd. Um, what level of milk production? I've got a research study going on here actually where we're um, comparing supplementation of organic animals. I've got some cows that are being supplemented versus some cows where they're getting grass only, and so far we haven't seen any loss of production. We're getting about 42 pounds um, out of those cows. Um, granted, this is during a great growing season uh, on pasture. Maybe in August when pastures start to dry up, we might lose some production uh, there. But so far, um, we haven't lost any production by not supplementing. And we have you know, a variety of crossbreds, mostly Jersey uh, and some Normandy and Swedish Red in our herd. Great. Um, and uh, why is AI a must? Uh, I think AI is a must because I, I think you you would sacrifice uh, too much genetic improvement. So you would sacrifice some. You're sacrificing possible milk production, um, good fertility, and longevity because we we can get proofs on those bulls uh, through genetic evaluation. So we actually know what those bulls are are going to transmit to their offspring. Uh, if you use a natural service bull, um, you might have no idea what they're going to be. Actually, if you uh, kind of an example, you might use a natural service bull, you might get 20 calves uh, out of this bull, and a majority of them might actually be duds uh, um, because you have no information, uh, no proof information of what those um, animals will have. So I, I think AI is a must uh, for genetic improvement. I think you you would sacrifice too much milk production and, and some of the other good advantages by using natural service bulls. Great. And then going along with this, um, the AI question, how much attention do you pay to body traits when selecting um, AI bulls within the breed? Um, I, I maybe pay a little bit of attention to body size traits. So, uh, I guess sire selection here for our, our dairy, we typically choose the um, the top bulls. So we use either net merit uh, on U.S. bulls or or the the French index, which is ISU, um, and then the total merit index in in Scandinavia. So we select the top bulls from that breed, and um, we we do give some consideration um, to body size once we've selected the top group of bulls. Um, I know the Normandies and Montbilliards, we tend to, uh, we pick the top bulls and then maybe place some emphasis on bulls that are a little bit smaller. 
Okay, thank you. Um, this person is from Hawaii, and they were wondering if you have any suggestions for crossbreeding systems that might work uh, well in a warm environment with lower quality tropical grasses. Um, they're uh, on pasture, and <coughs> sorry, they're on pasture, and they're also interested in knowing about which breeds or crossbreeds. Oh, might have uh, A2 rather than A1 casein milk. Let's ask, answer the first question first. Sure. The, the first question on grazing uh, maybe warmer grasses. Uh, um, the Normandy um, have, has done quite well. I showed some information where they're doing a lot of grazing in Colombia uh, in the tropics. Uh, they also do a lot of um, um, Jersey breeding um, in uh, some of the tropical areas, warmer climates. Uh, um, those two breeds seem to do quite well uh, in grazing those type of grasses um, and, and those heat conditions. Uh, even out here in western Minnesota we, we tend to get hot weather and, and uh, um, those breeds do well out here. The Montbilliard does quite well. Uh, um, they seem to do better in, in heat conditions. Really a lot of the um, crossbred cows seem to do better in, in a heat situation than, than say a pure Holstein or a pure breed. So really, I think you're going to get advantage even if you just cross some different breeds uh, in advantage for, for heat situation. Uh, the, the A2 question, um, I, I, I talk to a lot of producers uh, about A2. They have some questions. There are some breeds that have higher percentage of A2 than others, um, and some certainly promote that more than others. Um, Normandy has a higher percentage of A2 genetics. Uh, New Zealand Frisian has a high percentage of New Zealand genetics or, or of A2 genetics. Um, Montpelliard has some. Uh, really, when you start to get away from the Holstein breed, uh, you, and uh, you start getting a higher percentage of A2 genetics. Um, Jersey Guernsey has a um, high percentage as, as well. And usually, in a sire catalog, they they distinguish those bulls. Um, with A2, A2 symbol, or they tell you if it's A1, A2. Great. Um, do you have a, a three-way cross recommendation for a seasonal herd? A seasonal herd? Um, I, I think uh, the, the, the one group that we're trying to establish probably has some pretty good merit. Uh, Normandy, Jersey, uh, Scandinavian Red. Um, like the first slide that I show you, we, we typically calve almost 60 to uh, sometimes 75 percent of our cows in, um, in, in the spring here. So we are using those breeds and we think they can do quite well. Obviously, if you're going to do seasonal calving, you want to pick the bulls that have the highest fertility so you can get them bred back in your short window of time period. Um, and uh, the Normandy, the Montbilliard, um, do have excellent fertility for using in those breeds and the Swedish Red. So if you at least combine uh, uh, a Normandy or Swedish Red or Scandinavian Red and Montbilliard with another breed, I think you'll have a, a very good fertile cow for a seasonal calving herd. Great. Um, this person says that uh, white-faced cattle in uh, their herd suffer the worst from flies in the bright sun in, during the grazing, grazing season. And she was curious if you have seen that with the Montbilliard um, crosses and have you had uh, any pink, pink eye problems? Uh, yes, I, 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 I do get this question uh, from some producers. Yes, um, some producers have had issues with the, the white face on the Montbilliard uh, breeds, they um, do have a higher tendency to have pink eye. Um, we haven't really seen a whole lot out of our herd. We maybe get one, maybe two cases a year, if that. Um, I wouldn't be too um, um, worried about using those breeds from a pink eye standpoint uh, at all in a fly, fly problem. Um, I just haven't seen, I've gone to a lot of other herds and uh, with these breeds and they just don't seem to have the, the, the problem that maybe you have expected that they would. Yes, there, there could be some, but um, I, I think a, a few um, is, is probably not too much to be concerned about. 
Okay. Um, this person is wondering if you could briefly discuss the value of the less popular dairy breeds, such as Ayrshire, um, Guernsey's, Milking Shorthorns, and Dutch um, Belts for use in pasture dairy systems? Sure. Um, let's see. Guernsey, um, it does have advantages uh, compared to Jersey. They have high fat and protein in the milk. Um, one maybe disadvantage of the Guernsey is is possibly they don't have quite as good a feet and legs from a grazing standpoint, so they might be more apt to be lame than uh, um, other breeds they're used, but you would get high fat and protein. Maybe the fertility isn't quite as good um, from a Guernsey uh, or Guernsey crossbred. Ayrshire, um, Ayrshire would do quite well. They are related to the the, the red breeds, excuse me, the, the Swedish Scandinavian red breeds. So the Ayrshire does have lower somatic cell count. Um, I would tend to use uh, the the more, uh, well, the, the Scandinavian red breeds do have some Ayrshire ancestry, um, but I would tend to use the, the Scandinavian red breeds over, a, say, a U.S. Ayrshire. Uh, the U.S. Ayrshire is tended to be um, maybe more for showering type breeds uh, than, than, than uh, some of the other breeds. Um, as well, but they do have low somatic cell count uh, and uh, good production as well, and, and really good feet and legs. Um, Dutch belted and and some of the other uh, smaller breeds, uh, milking shorthorn, tend to not maybe have as much uh, genetic progress or genetic evaluations for those breeds. I know some people are using Dutch belted uh, on their dairies here in Minnesota, and and I we just don't have enough information. Uh, from using those breeds. Uh, there's not really a genetic improvement program uh, for those breeds, so it's really hard to get good data on whether those breeds are going to produce or not. But in the end, I think uh, if for your situation, if it works uh, and you can get those cows pregnant and they have high production and uh, are profitable, I think they would they would work uh, uh, depending on the, each manager's situation. Great. Um, this person is interested in uh, low, low line and Dexter for the small size. And do you have any um, any experience with mixing? Or I haven't had a, a whole lot of uh, specific uh, questions about using low line or Dexter for, for any um, breeds. I think they obviously are a lot smaller. We tend to have those for uh, more of a beef standpoint here uh, in western Minnesota. There are people using low-line uh, breeds for, from that standpoint. As far as milk production, I'm really not sure about uh, what their production characteristics would be. They would certainly be a lot less than a, a, a genetically improved dairy breed. And then going along with that, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of crossing a beef breed with a dairy breed? Uh, when you're um, crossing dairy and beef, uh, obviously you're going to get less production probably. Um, yes, you're going to capitalize uh, on that heterosis again. You're going to have uh, large amounts of heterosis, so you're probably going to have a fertile cow. Um, it just depends on what breeds that you would use in a crossing situation, uh, what beef breeds you would use. Um, but you, I think you would sacrifice some in milk production. A lot of um, if you go to Europe, where some of these multi yard herds uh, were, I've been there, and they're using some uh, beef breeds, uh, Charlet or Limousine, in the bottom 20% of their cows, so they're actually getting um, some beef crosses, but they're using those from a value-added standpoint to, to get additional income from beef production versus using those as milk cows. So they're feeding out the heifers and the bulls uh, from using a beef dairy cross. So y you could use it if it just depends on um, what, what your goal is. But you would sacrifice milk production if that's what you're trying to do. Great. Um, and this person is asking about um, similar research with uh, caprine herds. So do you know about, are you doing anything with goats or know of folks um, that are doing I any haven't work? I haven't really done anything with goats as far as um, 
different crossing breeds or anything like that. Most of the um, I, goat herd stuff that I've and producers I've talked to are typically using pure breeds. So I'm I'm sorry I don't have any really information on crossbreeding of goats. But I would suspect that the okay. um, oh. th there are ruminants, so that um, the information would be very similar. I would guess uh, depending on the certain characteristics of each of the breeds you're using, you're still going to have heterosis for fertility, uh, survival, things like that, um, using those breeds. Okay, this person asks, um, any advantage in using a crossbred AI bull? Um, yes, you, you, some people do use crossbred uh, AI bulls. Um, the, the problem with using a crossbred uh, AI bull is some of them don't have uh, genetic evaluations. We're starting to get some of those uh, um, evaluations. So if, if they did have a genetic evaluation where you could get, a say, a, a net merit index on those bulls and are able to compare that to other bulls, I think it would be a value to, if you had a high crossbred bull, yeah, you could certainly use that. Um, a lot of people... I would caution on using crossbred bulls. They think that, uh, as an example, I've got a Jersey Holstein crossbred bull. I'm going to breed it to some cows, and I'm going to expect to get a Jersey Holstein crossbred. Well, that's uh, not not always the case. You might have some that are, say, more Holstein uh, with more Holstein genetics in it, some with more Jersey genetics in it. Um, in New Zealand, they are uh, using uh, uh, crossbred bulls um, for in AI as sires, but they're getting uh, genetic evaluations on those bulls, and, and some of those bulls do rank higher than some of their pure breeds. Uh, kind of the, the Kiwi cross is what they call it. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're going to use a crossbred bull, I would certainly want to have a, um, some genetic information on that bull so you're able to compare it to other bulls. Okay, um, this person is interested in the Swedish Frisian. Um, they say, um, if the Swedish Frisian influences many generations back in Norwegian red pedigrees, how is it that the um, Norwegian red has a large dose of Swedish Frisian influence in current sires? But it, it, it just depends on the sire that was using. They um, some it's further back than others uh, in their pedigree, uh, but if you look at um, um, generations of pedigrees, there is uh, is a high percentage, only about 30%, so it's not as high. Eh? You know, there's still a lot of uh, different genetics in that Norwegian red breed, but there are some bulls that you might have to be careful. If you look in the sire catalog for Norwegian red, some of the bulls are black. Uh, they're not red at all, so they're going to throw black calves um, more than likely and uh, so some people could get uh, if they're choosing to want red cattle and they use a black Norwegian red bull uh, they might be disappointed and that's it's mostly from a color standpoint um, um, when, when that Swedish red or Swedish Frisian influence is in there. Great, and this person says um, uh, her experience is that a Hereford Holstein Jersey cross comes out like a Montbillard Billiard, sorry, Holstein Jersey cross. Uh, y yes, I would expect that too. You're, you've got similar um, similar ancestry. The the Hereford has got the white face just like a, a Montbillard does, and I would guess that they will come out very similar. Um, uh, very similar in, in, in characteristics uh, and color patterns. You might have a lot lower production because the Hereford is more of a beef breed, but uh, yeah, I would guess they would look exactly the same. Great, and that will be our last uh, question and comment for today because we're just about out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to ask Brad questions. And as I mentioned before, uh, this webinar is part of an ongoing series at eOrganic. Um, as a sneak preview, our January, our, excuse me, not January, July webinar um, will um, feature Dr. Hugh Kerman, who will talk about herd health issues. Um, 
until then, you can find an archive of today's session, uh, recordings of all of our uh, previous webinars, as well as articles, videos, and more at eextension.org um, slash organic underscore production. Um, thank you very much, Brad, for joining us today, and thank you all for coming.